Yeah. So I'd like to welcome you all to the Raising Peace Festival. We've had uh, already quite a lot of sessions uh, in days in the last few days, and there are more sessions coming up. Most of them are online. Some of them are hybrid. And what has been really great in this festival is that the faith traditions have contacted us and said, can we be part of, uh, of the Raising Peace Festival? We want to be part of peace. And I don't know what will come of this, uh, but I think there is something happening that people from all different faith traditions want to come together and talk about peace. We've already had a very good session with the Brahma Kumaris. Uh, the uh, Religions for Peace organized a good session. Tonight we are together and this coming Sunday, uh, there's a, uh, in, a multi-faith session with the Rigpa Buddhists at, uh, in Newtown. It's hybrid as well and you can join online if you'd like to. Yeah. So I don't know what will come of all these faith-based uh, events, but I'll, I'll think about it and I might be in contact. So welcome very much to uh, the Raising Peace Festival and I'll hand it over to Mary and Mark. Um, at this point, we'd like you to all mute yourselves. Um, we will give you plenty of time later on to um, talk in breakout groups and then we'll come back in, in a large group and allow you to talk. But um, we're going to hog the uh, speaking for the next little bit. Um, Mary, if you want to put up the PowerPoint. First of all, we want to thank the Raising Peace Festival folks for allowing us to participate. Um, there are 30 or 40 different groups who are part of the Raising Peace movement, and uh, it's a privilege for us to be part of that tonight. We're here representing two different uh, groups that we're a part of, sponsored by the Wellspring community, um, which is an Australia-wide Christian inclusive community. And there is the link to the website. And the other um, community is the Anabaptist Association. So we'll, we'll begin with a, um, talking a little bit about both of these communities and share that information with you. So if you want to know more about them, you can. The Wellspring Community website says, we aim to create a space where spirituality and justice meet to deepen our relationship with God. And I can't see all of what's on here. There we go. To care for the earth, to foster the growth of an Australian spirituality, and to practice peace, including working for a just relationship between First Nation communities and others. It was inspired by the um, Iona community known worldwide for its radical Christianity, poetic Celtic worship, and engagement with local and global issues. The Wellspring community was founded in 1992. And, oh, great. Well, we're gonna, moving here. There we go. Members and friends of Wellspring support each other as we actively work for peace and social justice, spirituality and worship, First Nations justice, sustainability, ecumenical and interfaith relations, and hospitality and homelessness. Those are the different uh, focus groups that are part of the Wellspring community. The Anabaptist Association, and there's the website for connecting with there. The Anabaptist Association links, links people in Australia and New Zealand who share a passion for Jesus, community, and reconciliation. The network finds inspiration from the life of Jesus, the earliest church, and the convictions of the first Anabaptist communities to be peacemakers and people who dream about and work for a more compassionate world. Anabaptism today is not about starting a new religion or denomination, but brings fresh pers perspectives on issues that matter and inspire people to go further and deeper in ways that make a difference. Now, a little bit about ourselves, for those who don't know us. We have been the AAANZ pastoral workers since its inception in the mid-1990s, and we are still that in an honorary, semi-retired kind of way. 
Um, both of us are ordained pastors, trained mediators, and workshop leaders on topics like biblical peacemaking, conflict transformation, trauma healing and resilience, parenting for peace and justice, and Anabaptist history and theology. Uh, we're also members of the Wellspring community and involved in the Peace and Justice Working Group. Now, since the mid-1970s, we have been active in peace and social justice campaigns in the USA, Canada, and Australia, including being arrested twice for pray in love makes away actions in then Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's office in 2015. And Mary's not um, crying here, she's actually singing as we're being led out of uh, Turnbull's office. These guys were looking for a fight and they were being <laughs> forceful. We're currently working with our neighbors in Lithgow, uh, New South Wales to stop Energy Australia from destroying Mount Walker and Lake Lyle in what we think is an unnecessary money-making scheme to build a pumped hydro project. Now, a few words about the theme of empire, which is the theme for this year's Raising Peace Festival. American theologian and historian Philip Jenkins writes, American, whoops, I'll let Mary take over for that one. <laughs> American politicians and historians have gone back and forth through the years on whether the country, the US, actually had an empire in the first place. And some even claimed a kind of American exceptionalism. Let me let somebody- Can I just interrupt? Uh, would you like to record this session? So it was that... being recorded. Is it being recorded? Yes. Oh, good. So after the pivotal year of 1898, nobody would really deny that the US had a real empire on European lines in the Philippines, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and elsewhere, not to mention short-lived but comparable ventures in Cuba, Haiti, Nicaragua, and other places. Um, do you want to make sure that the, it is being reported? Uh, let's see. Yeah, I set up earlier that it was okay. being reported. Okay. Okay. On uh, my screen, it shows recording. Okay, Thank good, you. good. There are too many people on for me to see that up in the corner. Thank so, you. So uh, we'll let the editor just edit out all these side comments here. <laughs> now, Australia is increasingly part of that American empire through our allowing American military bases on our soil and through the influence of American media and businesses. Empires thrive on totalism, an orientation that characterizes the thinking of a group or nation. American theologian Walter Brueggemann talks and writes about the prophetic imagination that presents an alternative to empire and its totalism. He says this, the first prophetic task is to be clear on the force and illegit illegitimacy of the totalism. And what we have to recognize is that almost all of us, conservative and liberals, almost all of us clergy and laity are to some extent inured in the totalism. We take it as normative. It's, it's the water that we swim in. And to take that as normative is a great narcotic that makes us passive and apathetic. Becoming clear and unambiguous about the force of the totalism is a teaching point that we really have to work at. Before we get into specifics of a more with less alternative way of living, which we wanna talk about tonight, we wanna to listen to the words of the American poet and farmer, Wendell Berry. Um, in a way, he's giving his response to totalism in the form of a poem that he calls the Manifesto, the Farmer Liberation Front. The Mad Farmer. <laughs> Love the quick profit, the annual raise, vacation with pay, want more of everything ready-made, be afraid to know your neighbors and to die, and you will have a window in your head. Not even your future will be a mystery anymore. Your mind will be punched, punched in a card and shut away in a little drawer. 
When they want you to buy something, they will call you. When they want you to die for profit, they will let you know. So friends, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing. Take all that you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Hope to live in that free republic for which it stands. Give your approval to all you cannot understand. Praise ignorance. For what man has not encountered, he has not destroyed. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop, whoops, somebody went it in, said that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the mold. Call that prophet. Prophesy such returns. Put your faith in the two inches of humus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Listen to carrion. Put your ear close and hear the faint chattering of the songs that are to come. Expect the end of the world. Laugh. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. So long as women do not go cheap for power, please women more than men. Ask yourself, will this satisfy a woman satisfied to bear a child? Will this disturb the sleep of a woman near to giving birth? Go with your love to the fields. Lie down in the shade. Rest your head in her lap. Swear allegiance to what is nighest your thoughts. As soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. <laughs> Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail the way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary, some in the wrong direction. Practice <laughs> resurrection. Okay, part of that is just thing. We get sucked in. So <clears throat> you to think about how we don't get sucked into what is any kind of group think at all. So prophets and poets aren't the only source of wisdom on resisting the totalism of empire. E.F. Schumacher, the economist author of Small is Beautiful, Economics as if People Mattered, has some good things to say on the subject. And here are some quotes from his book. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. Anyone who thinks consumption can expand forever on a finite planet is either insane or an economist. <laughs> have to laugh at some of these. <laughs> Wisdom demands a new orientation of science and technology toward the organic, the gentle, and the elegant and beautiful. The real problems are, of our planet are not economic or technical. They are philosophical. The philosophy of unbridled materialism is being challenged by events. And even though an economist, Schumacher, had a bit of poet about him. And he said, I certainly feel discouraged. Never feel. I, never, I certainly never feel discouraged. I can't myself raise the wind that might blow us or this ship into a better world, but I can at least put up the sail so that when the winds come, I can catch it. Now, even though E.F. Schumacher wrote this book back in the early 70s, if you move to the next slide, there is an ongoing um, Schumacher Center for a New Economics that continues to work and spell out his ideas. And they put out a, a 50th anniversary edition of his book. And they say, our mission is to envision a just and regenerative economy, apply the concepts locally, then share the results for broad replication. Um, so the Center for New Economics has a website. Um, you can get on their mailing list. They continue to 
uh, look at his book and they have a study guide that's also part of their website. Another economist that we've become aware of recently is Jason Hickel. He's um, written a book called Less is More. And in the blurb on the website for the book, it says it's a wake up call that we need by shining a light on ecological breakdown in the system that's causing it. Hickel shows how we can bring our economy back into balance with the living world and build a thriving society for all. This is our chance to change course, but we must act now. And Hickel actually challenges capitalism, uh, which for many is uh, a no-no, but he says there's a better way for us to live and to deal with our world. So we wanna to turn to this idea of living more with less. In a world of unbridled consumerism, many of us are drowning in stuff. And this stuff and the resources needed produce, to produce this stuff are often the source of conflict and destruction of our planet. Doris Jansen Longacre was born on 15th of February, 1940 in Newton, Kansas. She received her BA degree in home economics from Goshen College, a Mennonite university in Indiana, USA, and did graduate studies at Goshen Biblical Seminary and Kansas State University. With her husband, Paul Longacre, and her two daughters, she worked with Mennonite Central Committee, which is the Relief, Development, and Peace Agency of North American Mennonites. In Vietnam in the years 1964 to 1967, and in Indonesia in 1971-1972. And if you are old enough to remember back to those years, they were years of turmoil. She served as the chairperson of her local Mennonite congregation and was a member of the Board of Overseers of Goshen Biblical Seminary. It was a frequent speaker on world hunger. More with less came to be associated with Doris through two books that she compiled as part of a Mennonite Central Committee assignment. The More With Less Cookbook is a collection of recipes and suggestions on how to enjoy, enjoy more while consuming less of the world's resources. It was first published in 1976. I still have my, no, I don't. I have a second copy. My first copy went to my, our son when he moved out. <laughs> Um, the last time I checked, it sold over 2 million copies worldwide. It's been translated into German, and I'm not sure how many other uh, languages. The 40th anniversary edition is part of a five-book collection of cookbooks known as the World Community Cookbook Series. Unfortunately, Doris died of cancer on the 10th of November, 1979, just months before the completion of her second book, Living More With Less. This book, filled with personal testimonies of people searching for ways to simplify their living, was a tribute to Doris's lifelong quest for ways to live responsibly and joyfully in a world neighborhood. 30 years later, Living More With Less, the 30th, 30th anniversary edition, was published as a way to celebrate and honor Doris's foresight and vision and to pass on that vision for simple and sustainable living to a new generation. It was revised and updated by Valerie Weaver Zerker. And this 30th anniversary edition is true to Doris, Doris's spirit of living in ways that keeps poor people, God's creation and each other in mind and is loaded with new and practical tips in areas such as money, travel, clothing, housing, celebrations, and recreation. Now, part of the thing is that book, Living More With Less, whoops, somebody else wants to join us, um, is a, uh, we think that living peacefully ha includes all kinds of things. Because of how we live, it impacts others. And so her book is broken down into a variety of things. But let me give you, this is what one uh, reviewer said. Brian McLaren, afterwards, his afterward is the icing on the cake for me. 
McLaren spells out the way of reading the book and taking on the challenges outlined therein with an outlook of joy and grace rather than guilt. It helped me too that he specifically opens up the idea to those who are not Mennonite or even Christian. While I felt the invitation in the pages, it was nice to see it spelled out so explicitly. My favorite bit, grace is our best invitation for a more with less lifestyle. Having received grace ourselves, we want our neighbors in poverty to receive it too. Even our enemies need grace, we realize. So do the rivers and streams, the soil and the wind, the same goes for the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, the flowers and the creatures of the field. We want all to be given all the grace they need to thrive and prosper. It is our joy to live with less so that others may have enough. Susie Gunther Lowen is a writer for the periodical Canadian Mennonite, and in an article entitled Cooking Up Discipleship, she describes how she grew up with the More With Less cookbook, but only in her adult years came to understand that living more with less was more than just about cooking and eating responsibly in a world of hunger and injustice. She says, Surprisingly, it's only recently that I have begun to understand it as a theology, albeit one which defile, defies most conventions. She quotes Melinda Berry, a theologian and seminary professor who wrote a PhD dissertation on the topic, saying that more with less theology is a constructive theology of social responsibility, nonviolence, and nonconformity. Um. Okay, she, she defines theology as our talk about God, concluding that more with less theology com is comprised of the connection we make between God's unified presence in the universe and our response to God as we live within the world. More with less theology gives special attention to the ways that ec economic patterns and systems help or hurt this response to God and all that is around us. For me, it doesn't just impact poverty. Poverty often is some of the problems that cause destruction and wars and that sort of thing. Okay. Okay, Long, Long Acres standard of doing justice, learning from the world community, nurturing people, cherishing the natural order, and non-conforming conforming freely are part of our household code as Christians. In this age of globalization, when our world is both a vibrant village marketplace and a groaning ecosystem, such a household code is more necessary than ever. And I want you to know, we're gonna go through all of these five different things that she suggests and work at them a little further. So when we get back to having you in groups, I want you to think about whether you've thought about these before, whether you think they would work, whether you would, how you'd like to practice them, that sort of thing. So the first one is do justice. Dar starts her chapter on do justice with a quote from a longtime mission worker in East Africa. North Americans find it very hard to believe that their wealthy ways of living affect poor people on other continents. But in Africa, people are fully convinced that North Americans and Australians and, and their actions strongly influence their lives. Uh, we believe, as Mary just said, that you could easily replace the term North Americans with Australians and New Zealanders. And the point would be the same. The way we live affects others in the world. We are all in this together. Rich Western countries import many of the resources that underpin our way of life. And we import many of these resources at low prices from economically impoverished countries while sending back even higher price manufactured goods. Another problem is military spending. World military spending is now over 1 billion US dollars a day. 
exports of weapons to low income countries have quadrupled since 1960. Okay, Lawmaker discover, discusses the feelings of guilt that can cripple us when we become aware of the, these facts. But then she says, our guilt must resolve itself into lasting attentiveness. This means being mindful, conscious, and aware so that never again can we make a decision about buying and using without thinking of the poor. They lurk in the new car lot and behind the rack of autumn fashions. They sit beside you in the restaurant and wait for you in the voting booth. There are times when the only answer is, because they have little, I try to take less. She says, to make due justice a standard to live by, both reason, it takes both reason and compassion. The classic universal truths of the Old and New Testament makes excuse impossible. God has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Longacre argues that simple living, living is, not a ma, not, uh, is not enough. The fact is that living by the standards do justice will draw us more deeply into economics and politics. And for the sake of the poor and hungry, that's good. Solutions for their needs will come primarily through economic and political change. And we experienced a bit of that over the weekend, uh, working here at the local level, working at the pre-polling and polling um, stations over Friday and Saturday, trying to make change at the local level. But this is something that we need to do at the national and international level as well. Her next point is to learn from the world community. When Westerners travel to poorer nations, we often think about ways to improve their plight. We are the smart ones with the answers. But Dara says, what if we became as concerned with our overdevelopment or maldevelopment as we are with the underdevelopment of poor nations? Would they have anything to say? Could they help? And she says, today Christian churches are solidly rooted in most economically poor countries. Our responsibility to share and tell doesn't necessarily diminish, but something new is added. It's the responsibility to accept and listen. It's a two-way street. We can listen and learn from others. Her next point is to nurture people. Doris quotes from our friend Wendell Berry and says, that to understand our time and predicament, we can view ourselves as divided between exploitation and nurture. The standard of the explo exploiter is efficiency. The standard of the nurturer is care. The exploiter's goal is money, profit, and the nurturer's goal is health, his land's health, his own, his families, his communities, and his countries. Dara says this, to make choices that nurture each other, we must always be asking the question, what do we want for ourselves and the persons we love? That's hard enough to answer, but then comes another question. Is what we say we want borne out by our choices? Actions define our values more clearly than our words. Doris goes on to discuss label saving devices and the busyness of our lives being having all of these machines. And she says, how do we nurture each other with choices that offer more calm, quiet, and time to reflect on and integrate life? Nurturing people surely involves a commitment to reduce stress. Her next point is to cherish the natural order. She says, humankind's most violent acts against the environment took place in the past 200 years. Say that again. Humans' most violent acts against the environment 
took place in the past 200 years. Today, we have the means to, to make our home, meaning the earth, totally uninhabitable. We must cherish the natural order. Besides being a matter of survival for us all, it is also a matter of good stewardship. With shameless greed for profit, we proceed in pushing the limits, doing what nature never intended. We need a peace treaty with nature. Right here. Okay. <laughs> this is an area where we have much to learn from indigenous people and systems of land care around the world in which private ownership bows to the communal good. We need to find ways to fit the way we live to the environment, not trying to reshape the environment to our whims. Her next point is to non-conform freely. Non-conformity is not easy. It is not simple to live a life of simplicity. Doris warns us that today we need to be always on the alert not to be carried away with the bigger and better slogans of our society. The young must be taught to appreciate the freedom of not being enslaved to material things. In the West, we pride ourselves on living in the free world. Yet, Doris warns, we submit daily to brainwashing by commercial interests that must be equal to, if not more powerful than, the political slogans of totalitarian governments. Am I still going to... In our world, we cannot get away from advertising and its influence. It's part of the totalism that we were talking about earlier. Our affluence is stifling us, but we can't see it. Often it takes someone from elsewhere to point out what is happening. An African bishop from Uganda told a gathering of Western Christians Technology and material things can never liberate you. They have a tendency to squeeze you into their own image. Longacre writes, though, simplicity is a narrow road of self-discipline, but the alternative, money and materialism, is only another master. With marvelous elements of surprise and mystery, discipline simplicity offers freedom. Doris concludes her section on nonconform freely with these thoughts. More with less means choosing limitations. Few of us, however, can live alone by new standards. Taking the narrow way is too risky. And what that means is we need each other. We need community to support us. Modern life brings with it mobility that can be both a blessing and a curse. Wherever we find ourselves, it is important to find others to support us in our attempt to live a non-conformed life. So, what do you think? We're going to put you into some breakout rooms. I hope you were taking notes, <laughs> or at least thinking about it. And what we want you to do is, one, get to know your group. We'll put you in groups of like three or four. And we want you to think about what did you find helpful? of those things? What did you disagree with? Have you been applying these standards in your own life and not even, you know, not even knowing Doris's stuff? Or are there ways that you think you could start applying some of these things? You want to talk and I'll put them into groups. So Mary's going to do the technical stuff here of putting you into groups. We think, yeah, here we go. Okay, how many? Of so them? we will um, give you about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes in your groups. And then after that, we will bring you back and we will have some group discussion and you can share with um, everybody else your thoughts. You challenge us or whatever. Okay. You, do you know what you're doing? Well, welcome back. What? <laughs> you think about uh, we're interested in hearing your point of view just unmute yourself and share yeah we're on mute or tell us what you learned maybe from other people in oh um 
our friend from Melbourne was just talking about a lady who teaches permaculture. Um, so uh, we, we're still hearing about that. I'm not sure what the lady's name is, but maybe he can tell us. Uh, Her name's Rosemary Morrow. Oh. Ah, yes. Yes. She lives in the Blue Mountains. All yes. oh, right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. But, um, okay, so, go ahead, Julie. Go ahead. Is that um? Does she teach online? Does she teach? Um, uh, there are videos online, um, and um, she um, has classes sometimes that are um, uh, online, but mainly uh, she teaches in groups, uh, person to person. Uh, uh -huh. She's also been involved in permaculture for refugees, uh, which, oh, is, yes. which, which is another thing that um, you, there's a lot of war going on and which creates displaced people and refugees yeah. are put into camps and they basically have nothing to do. And she goes to places like Bangladesh mm -hmm. and works with the people in the camps and they learn the principles of how to develop a, a system of um, plants and water and um, caring for the soil and so forth. And they design their own program. And so it gives them um, a creative way of actually dealing with their time in the camps, but also it gives them a way to deal with um, situation when they get out of the camps. And, and so uh, it, it's a really a wonderfully creative program. Um, permaculture is, is something that um, it has, you know, ethical principles that um, you know, uh, Mark and Mary were talking about um, that Wendell Berry and others uh, were, were advocating and it's um, open, you know, to um, people, um, all, all kinds of people, you know, so it doesn't have to rely on faith communities, but it just works uh, with people as people. Here in New South Wales, permaculture is, has been uh, offered several places uh, that other people can take and learn about permaculture. How can um, people learn about um, permaculture in in camps if they don't? They wouldn't have soil. They wouldn't have anything to work on, would they? In ca in camps. Well, that th they do have, um, you know, a few resources, but yeah, okay. they're, they're basically working with very limited uh, resources. And so, one of the things that um, Roe has done is uh, create a, a book about first aid. How, okay. how do you provide first aid uh, for people with limited resources and mm. um, and do it in a way that um, is easy to understand. It's done through illustrations and um, so that people can, um, you know, w whether they're mm. coming from uh, Myanmar or um, Afghanistan or wherever, you know, the, they, they can learn how to deal with the situation with very limited resources. Mm. But um, yeah, Roe has taught uh, in, in virtually all of the war-torn countries around the world, uh, with, you know, from Vietnam and Cambodia and um, Serbia and um, the Congo and <laughs> All, all, all these countries uh, and so she she knows how to deal with a uh, situation with very limited resources oh. interesting would you be able to put the um the name in the chat her name there are many resources of people who are doing things with permaculture, culture like Mora gamble um there's, um, you know, all the works from Bill Mollison from the early days. And there's people who are actually doing things about regenerating soil, which has been very effective in in, um, in places in Africa. There's right. 
Nem quer nem. Oh, I talked a little bit about one of my hobbies, which is working in the repair cafe um, that we have um, several of in Canberra. And um, I come and meet her in a sewer um, just for fun and um, for making my own clothes. But um, I really enjoyed the movement into doing repairs and um, mm -hmm. thinking creatively about how to make something wearable again after it's, you know, crutchless and <laughs> the yeah. usual stuff, um, things like that um, and fixing um, uh, socks in various different ways. And I, I think I said to Clyde, my husband, that it's, um, so, for me, it's like going to um, a place where they give me puzzles all the time and ask me how to fix them. <laughs> And I really, really enjoy that. I do it twice a month um, as a volunteer um, in different parts of Canberra. And, um, yeah, it's something that I've, I've learned to really, really enjoy. Um, and that's about both simplifying and passing on skills because that's the other thing you, you learn when you're trying to simplify your life is that you don't always have the skills that people mm -hmm. had a generation ago or two generations ago and I found the young people super excited about learning how to do things like hem this their trousers up or stuff like that so mm -hmm. um, I give away people I give them cotton and needles and tell them that they can take up the other leg after we've done the first one so. <laughs> very good yeah they do that at reverse garbage in um in Brisbane as well they and they oh. have a library and they have um they have mm -hmm. classes yeah. yes yeah yeah we we were saying that the, um, jason was mentioning that like things that are 50 years old are, are still relevant um ideas that um you know were, were very fashionable in the 70s are suddenly coming back as we Start realizing that we that greed is good, swallowed it all up, and uh, and it's coming back again. So I thought that that was a very thoughtful, um, yeah. Thinker. Yeah, E. F. Schumacher when he came out with his uh, "Small is Beautiful," many economists kind of wrote him off. But when you go back and read it and the stuff that he was saying, it was very prophetic. And yeah. he was saying, and now to see other people picking up that idea and saying, yeah, that was that was right all along. You know, we, we can't continue to grow our economy particularly in the Western world year after year after year that it's just not possible to do that. It's like Greta, Greta said, said to the, um, was it the one, one of the big climate conferences that it's time we stopped dreaming that fairyland dream that you could keep on growing because you jolly well couldn't. Mm -hmm. Stop trying to sell it to us kids because we're not that stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Other folks, something from your group or a question or comment that you want to make? I'll just make a comment. It wasn't so much in our group, but just on on that line. Uh, I just, I just, my growing a, an econ the economy, which in our privileged state, yeah, it, it has problems worldwide. But um, it, but to the third world, we 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 seem to want to encourage their economies to to grow, you know, from a very low base, so that they can actually start. You know, uh, surviving better without, without. Uh, and I was thinking the um, the boxes for the Christmas child that sort of churches collect um, each year. Um, one, you know, there's one. There's a big effort to pack the boxes, and then they have to be collected, and then there's a ten dollar charge to actually send it send it across for every box. There's there's a ten dollar charge. And it's been criticised because um, Franklin Graham. Uh, those boxes go into the communities. The kids, you know, the kids might enjoy them, but it, but it actually takes away from the local economy because the local merchants 
can't sell their little Christmas presents to the kids oh, at Christmas. Right. Um, and so there's a quite a negative side that actually, you know, people have criticised as, as they go into the community. So, um, and I just had this um, dilemma that we're encouraging, we want to encourage um, growth in, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, overseas community which has nothing, Mm -hmm. uh, and yet over here, um, we we know that you know large growth is problematic for the for the whole ecology. So just throw that in. <laughs> mm. And I think we can only be an example ourselves. And living simplistically doesn't mean that you don't have heating in the winter or. Um, and that you go without, you know, proper food, um, that you need to have your own basics covered. Um, and it might also mean having a car uh, so that you can get around and, and lead your life. So I don't think it means living in, in post -profit poverty and saying I should enjoy this. Um, I think it is also being careful about your own life and and the things you buy. And I also mentioned there's this thriving second-hand market with my, a Facebook marketplace. And my daughter is part of a Facebook group where she lives. And, it's, and you only swap. No money changes hands. But if she's got something to sell, then uh, she might say, well, uh, I'd like a hand of bananas for this or a bottle of yeah, oil or, mm -hmm. or whatever. So it always changes um it's not for free, but it is a swapping and it always seems to work out. And it's just you leave things on somebody else's doorstep and they then leave something on your doorstep. Mm. And I think there are a lot of these exchanges. Mm. I think another thing is looking at what you do buy because um, one of the things that we've done sort of for a long time now is make our own soap. And I know that sounds sort of really old fashioned, but <laughs> um, we just make it out of um, usually recycled um, vegetable oils that you can get from shops where they've used them and they've got cans of them that they have to get sent away with um, and um, animal fat, which um, I was explaining to my compatriot. Um, we um, have a farm where um, we have feral animals like we're not grazing the place at all we're trying to grow trees on it basically and um, but feral animals come in so we have deer and and pigs now I've had to learn how to butcher them because my son is a bow hunter and he um, kills them um, but we I then my children say a family that butchers together stays together so I'm hoping that's true <laughs> um, but um, I use all of the leftover fat from any of those animals and there's still some fat on them because um, even in the lean times, um, particularly the wild boar and that, they have um, thing. But I've had great success with some of the deer as well. So we use those things to make the soap and um, then we give it to other people because what, like the soap, when you make it, the chemical reaction keeps the glycerin in the soap. So it means that you can wash your hair um, with it and you can um, use it in the um, dish. Like I don't have a dishwasher, just in a sink with one of those shaker things. Um, and um, like it basically cuts down. I don't have, I go into my bathroom sometimes and I go into other people's bathrooms and there's like 14 bottles of plastic stuff of one kind or another. And we've got a renewable bottle of vinegar that I keep down in the corner that I sort of use. I warm up on the shelf with lavender in it and that sort of stuff. But other than that, we don't have any bottles at all. And we just use the soap and it's easy to clean off the bathroom mirror, of uh, bathroom um, doors and all that sort of stuff. So it's, I, I think those little steps like that can have all these big spin-offs so that we, because we have extra soap, um other people have the soap and they don't have to go and buy the bottles <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, it's sort of one of those things and I, I started doing that in the in COVID because um people 
couldn't get soap off the shelves and there was a, a new mum in our street. So we gave her some a little package full of like some of the homemade stuff. And I make all my face creams from beeswax, which we grow here to the bees, and um, olive oil. Um, and like I use that for my hands and my face. And so I get the nice things, um, but have a minimal impact on the world with those things and no bottles, which is sort of another really great thing. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Great yeah very interesting. That's mm. huge. Mm. And does it work in the washing machine? Um, I don't use it in the washing machine. I use washing soda in the washing machine um, because um, sometimes you can get soap scum, but I have I have used it. Um, you just got to sort of add lots of water to it. Um, so um, I oh, opted well. for the washing, washing, washing soda, which has um, got none of the other additives that the – um clothes washing detergent has um is that in bicarbonate of soda no 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 this is washing soda it's a calcium carbonate okay thank you and is that is that all right to go onto the onto the garden yeah. that's why i use calcium carbonate rather than some of the other ones yeah because i have to i've got mine going onto the garden and yeah. i'm trying to make sure that nothing goes on that will soak through yeah no no it's calcium and um yeah, carbon. So, yeah. Mm. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, these are the kind of stories that get shared in the book "Living More with Less," and mm -hmm. it's also, I think, an illustration of why we need communities yes. of people who are all doing this kind of thing because we get ideas from other people. Mm -hmm. We get we're not the oddballs because other people are doing the same thing and we're doing it for a good reason to to save our environment um, mm. so, yeah thanks for sharing that mm. other things that people might be doing that you can share with others well one th one thing that um, uh, comes to my mind is is just by uh, being more intentional in community with others which which is, isn't always easy to do, but um, allows us to share the material things we all need to get by, but that we don't need to have all the time. Mm -hmm. I, I'm struck by the statistic that the average power drill that probably each one of us owns is only running for 15 minutes for its entire life uh, in our, in our uh, houses. And we could have one drill that uh, a lot of people could share and uh, we'd have uh, more money to spend on other things and mm. um, and and we'd, we'd have uh, closer ties with our neighbors and the people who we are doing the sharing with. We could share uh, automobiles, we could share just all kinds of things and greatly reduce our our, our footprint and our dependency on having so much stuff now of course to the to the big industries that manufacture drills um it's really good that we're all living isolated lives in our own little houses <laughs> yeah. if we get divorced then hey there's two households we can sell two <laughs> drills um so the the more we're uh our connections to one another break down the the better it is for um, big industry, but it's not necessarily good for us, and it's certainly not good for the planet and for the people mm -hmm. we share it with. Yeah, when when we lived uh, in Indiana, there was a community of us, and we shared all kinds of things. And the fun thing to find was the waffle iron, because <laughs> you go to the person that owned it, and they'd say they gave it to so and so, and they gave it to so and so, and Houston. <laughs> And to follow the waffle iron around the community, but we had lots of things like that that we shared because we thought. Why do we all need a waffle iron? Why do we all need even a lawnmower? We shared a lawnmower, we shared wheelbarrows, we shared all kinds of things. An extension mm -hmm. ladder. Why does everybody need an extension ladder? Yeah. <laughs> so, good point. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I, yeah. I think there are, I think in Sydney, there are places where you can go and borrow tools and then give them back. I think that's the case. Yeah, we I haven't done that, but I think that's the case. Yeah, in Canberra, we have a tool library. Um, yeah. That's 
it's I mean one suburb now and it's on the other side of Canberra not that far but um yeah I think they're starting to come up in more places they just take quite a lot of organization and yeah. maintain yeah. this stuff so yeah. Yeah. it's it's that sort of thing the other thing I, I know someone who started one over here in in Victoria Park in in Perth um Talk said, you know, for people to borrow tools. Yeah, so mm. yeah, it's a wonderful idea. It's just yeah. just keep it keeping track of things. So I I know um when mm. I had family living closer, I could never track down my ladders. That they, they were shopping <laughs> ladders, and I couldn't work out who had the ladder. And just the mm. wanted it. To put your names on everything. <laughs> Or well, sort of some sort of little beeper thing that when you want to right. work out without having to ring every single person who's got it. Yeah. Yeah, somebody borrowed a hymn book from you and you had trouble getting it back. Oh, yes. But we were we were like like um what do you call those sort of hounds that follow their noses till we found it. Yeah, it keeps, okay. Keeps people in relationship, even tracking down what you've you've given to other people to use. Yeah. <laughs> Mm. Yes, that's right. Sorry. Well, I like sorry. You're good. Okay. I like gardening and I saw on the um I saw on the Facebook that somebody was selling plants and I went over there and she's got um lots of plants, very reasonable costs. And um she um she started selling she she suddenly realized in COVID that she could propagate all her plants or a lot of her plants and sell them and she's still doing that now and she's um the money's going to the UNHCR um organization and I just felt it was I was so um impressed and I felt so um buoyed up by her spirit because um some years ago she had lost her son to cancer and she she and her husband sort of looked around and said, well, how are we going to live? You know, we've got to live for other people. And that's what she she's um, she's doing in a small way. And I, I was very pleased with bringing plants, which usually in a, in a nursery would be so expensive, and um, bringing them back. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Mm. 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 I know there's a community in Melbourne. Um, that they have a community garden, but then they also have a box and people put extra produce, extra plants, whatever they are, and they swap things. So if you've got it, you put it in. If you need it, you go and you pick it up. And yes, it's sir. quite a large box of doing that sort of thing. Um, yes. That's just with plants and vegetables, you know, things, produce that you create. Mm. Well, just going back to what Bruce was saying about um, uh, third world countries and development. I was involved in overseas aid at one stage and what I found that really worked and I had to look, I was on a, a board of a overseas aid agency and had to look at uh, projects in Southeast Asia. And the ones that were really successful were very little. Um, and the organization had given like seed funding for very small things. Mm. and training for things that, for example, in the Philippines, um, people have lost their faith in traditional medicines that are made out of herbs in their own gardens, and they'll just about beggar themselves to buy Western medicine, and often it's out of date. It's really, really sad. Mm. So one of the projects was to provide training about the use of herbs and um, other things that people could actually make themselves and mm -hmm. uh, and to train uh, somebody in every village as the herbalist um, and that person usually was a widow or said she was because her husband had never returned from the sea um, and that was actually I saw so many villages where the herbalist was actually making enough living to support her whole family and the people in that village were so much healthier 
because they weren't depending on Western medicine. They were depending on something that this lady made. And she'd often teach other people how to make it, uh, mm -hmm. the local herbs and, and things that grew. So I think mm -hmm. if overseas aid stuff is done in in conjunction with the locals. Um, yeah, sure. They are actually the ones that work out what would work in Absolutely. our community and that the organisation who is doing the organising listens and puts that into place so that still the locals are in charge, still the locals are doing all the training. That's when it works. Um, mm. It's only when we impose our own idea of how to do things that they don't. Um, and these ones will keep going, I'm sure, because the ladies who are making their medicines were showing their children how to make their medicines. Um, and, uh, you know, so it was being passed on and revived all those ancient things that they knew from before. Mm. I saw quite a few of that kind of thing right throughout um, mm. the Philippines and, uh, and through India and so on. So I think that it's the small is beautiful thing that really works, not the great big new industry that's going to employ lots lots more people from a corporation that's going to make yeah, a big mess. True. Yeah. Just reminds me of a book that I read a, a few years ago, Tony Ronaldo's Forest Underground. Anyone yeah. read that one? Yes. The Christian book of the year, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A wonderful story. Um, basically, he was he went he went to Niger to uh, plant tree in you know, a plant trees type ministry, and he found out when he got there that you know eighty percent of the trees, ninety percent of the trees that were planted all died, and he got this idea that the all the all the farms had these stumps all over their mm -hmm. property, and they're getting these little shoots out of out of these out of these stumps and he decided to start pruning them mm. and they, grew, they, they were the native trees that were you know were, were growing there for thousands of years and they all grew up these stumps these shoots grew up grew up into trees and it changed the whole economy for those farmers mm. that caught on and it went went to a worldwide thing so that was just a wonderful story and it was all local mm. local generated eventually yeah yeah, that's the, the learning from the world community. Mm, uh, mm. Not going in thinking that we know what's best for people. Mm. I guess my question is, I, I feel like it's important to have a community. How are you all doing that? How are you connecting to community? How are you... Like I like Jason's idea of sharing tools, but how, like at present, we're not doing that with anybody. How do you go about developing that? Because we just moved to Lithgow and so we don't have that kind of community developed. How do you go about doing that? Saying I've got a waffle iron. <laughs> Somebody will borrow it. <laughs> you can use um, Facebook and stuff like that um, to, put a feeler out to see if there's anyone who's interested. Um, and I think the other thing that um, look around and see if there's a group like, so I'm connect, the repair cafes are both run by a group called Sea Change, which is society, environment and economics um, in Canberra. And um, sort of they've got some paid workers but they've also got heaps of volunteers. So if you might be able to find somewhere like that, you could connect to, or even a, if there's a church, um, sometimes people will join together with things like that, where mm -hmm. they already have a relationship. It's a bit hard, as you say, when you're starting out with new relationships. Um, well, I just went to a community lunch at the local Anglican church and a, friendship group afterwards at the Uniting Church, um, lady talking about walking the Camino. But um, so the local churches here have, in Mayland, in Perth, Western Australia, have, you know, community events people can mm. go to or connect with. 
Mm. There's an online app called Next Door where people can connect. Yes, there is. Oh. Mm. For us uh, living at North Mead, we live in a dead end street. So it's fortunate that we've got to know our nearby neighbours. Um, it's a fairly stable community. So um, we've now got quite good relationships and you know share things to some degree. And then our local church, uh, we also have built up relationships there. And so there's the possibility of, of um, doing things together in a way because we've, we've got to know people through our local church. On another matter that we haven't touched on in terms of food is uh, my wife and I have moved away from our, uh, how much meat we eat. That mm. uh, We've deliberately uh, become not totally vegetarian, but certainly more vegetarian mm. than, than we were. So mm. uh, conscious of particularly red meat and uh, how we need as a world to move away from how much uh, land is used for cattle grazing and so forth. And how can mm -hmm. we reduce our meat consumption and rely more on white meat and, and more fruit and vegetables? So just yeah. offer that for a couple of thoughts. Yeah, we've moved yeah. from a lot of beef to eating more kangaroo. Um, mm -hmm. That is actually leaner and it's... Better for the environment. <laughs> better for the environment. So, you know. Yeah, true. Well, what I'd like to do, if nobody else has any um, other thoughts, is turn it back to Weiss and have her tell us a little bit more about what's going on with the Raising Peace Festival over the rest of this week um, and let her wrap things up. So thank you very much for all of you for coming and participating this evening. And let me just say, if you go to the notes that people have written, there's all kinds of information that people have added uh, at the side of the, the Zoom. The chat. Yeah. And if, if people want to save chat, it's different to how it used to be. If you go on the chat bottom, um, box down the bottom, click on the chat, and when you get to the chat opened up, there's three little dots up the top. If you click on them, it enables you to save chat. Ah, thank you. Yeah. Ask, um, if you could put your Mary and I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. Uh, if you could put your email address in. I have a friend in Lithgow who would love to know about you. Okay, we'll do. We'd like her too. Okay. Well, thank you all for participating, and thank you, Mary and Mark, for uh, pre you know going. You've put a lot of effort into preparing this webinar, and thank you for doing this. And the Raising Peace Festival has a lot of different types of uh, uh, webinars or hybrid sessions. And uh, we especially have on Saturday morning, we've got our major event on the 21st of September, and that is in the CBD in Sydney, but it's hybrid. You can also come online. We were asked by World Beyond War, a global organization to participate in four, uh, they've organized four events to go around the world. And it's mainly focused on uh, the US bases around the world and how that is making our world more unsafe. And what can we do about that? Uh, those four events, they will start off on the 21st at 9 a.m. in Sydney. So if you're coming along in person, you need to be there, sit down by 10 to 9, because this is, a, this is going to be broadcast around the world. So we need to start on the dot of 9. Then... Uh, so we will do four hours on Saturday morning, then it moves to Germany, then to Colombia and then to the US. Uh, and so we part of this around the world, uh, yeah, partnering with World Beyond War. Uh, so we're quite honored doing this and, uh, and we hope it will work out. We've got a fantastic lineup of speakers. I'm always amazed at how keen people are who are who've studied the issues of peace from all different angles how yeah how willing they are to uh, be part of our events uh, no payment nothing they just love to have the platform to talk about their research their knowledge uh, their yeah their insights into what makes the world more unsafe and what makes the world safer so that is our big event on Saturday morning, and you can still register for it. There is a small charge, and I think it's now a flat rate of 20 Australian dollars. 
but otherwise we're also promoting other events. When you're in Sydney on Saturday afternoon at three o'clock, there is the uh, Prayers for Peace, a very large multi-faith event that a Uniting Church Minister in Warunga organizes, and it's at Knox Grammar School. Uh, and I've been to those, it takes a bit of time because you start with an Aboriginal prayer for peace and then you need to get to the Zoroastrians. And there's a lot of religions between the A and the Z, uh, but it's always very, yeah, I always come away from it feeling uplifted. Uh, there's also a link on our website, on our calendar, to uh, the peace lecture being broadcasted from Brisbane. And I don't know, Elizabeth, if you, uh, yeah. if you know about this, but it's broadcast from the Anglican Cathedral in Brisbane, but it's yeah. organized together with WILF, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, but also uh, with Griffiths University and another peace organization. It's a lovely collaboration. And they've got, uh, and it's, the speakers are a, a Jewish speaker and a Palestinian speaker. So that is also of interest. And there's a multi-faith event, as I mentioned before, on the Sunday afternoon uh, from four till six at the Rig Power Buddhist Center in Newtown in Sydney, but you can also join online. And then on Sunday night from seven to eight, we have our, uh, uh, what did we call it, Chris? Our, our online happy hour for raising peace. So you're all welcome to come to that and talk about the raising peace uh, yeah, the event that we've had in Sydney, that we've had this year, and what might we do next? We purposely have not included a lot of uh, climate change environmental topics, because we found it was too big a topic to fit in between everything else that we're doing. But the next event will have uh, a lot more. Uh, yeah, we hope to focus on climate change and the environment and peace. How, how that links together, uh, because peace is our, uh, is our central theme. So that's my little promo for Raising Peace. And thank you all for coming. And it's lovely to meet people from around Australia uh, and that you've all joined in.